Welcome to the session on detection and identification uh, of Silella. Uh, during this one day and a half, we heard a lot about the bacterium, about its interaction with the plant, and then with the vector. And I think now this session on identification and detection is surely relevant for all these former um, input that we have got. So the first uh, speaker is Françoise Petet from Apple. And she um, will talk about uh, the transnational research collaboration uh, in order to organize the regional standards and the EPO protocol, diagnostic protocol on uh, Xylella fastidiosa. Please. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the. Oh, sorry. That's a good start. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the organizers for... Uh, we do not have a screen. Okay. The screen is not on here. Okay. So thanks to the organizer for the invitation to present um, uh, the EPO diagnostic protocol. And uh, what I would really like to show you is um, how we can use the research outcomes to improve our standards. So that I hope I will succeed in showing that. First of all, uh, EPO in a few words. Uh, so we are a regional plant protection organization, and at the moment there are nine regional plant protection organizations around the world. Uh, soon, from next year, we should have a tenth one. Uh, our organization has been created in uh, 1951, and we have now 51 member countries, and we have countries from North Africa, to the north of Norway, as well as from Scotland to Vladivostok. So that's quite a, a large region to cover. Our convention established what we should do for our member countries. And in practice, it means that we work in the area of plant quarantine, efficacy of plant protection products. So there was a question on efficacy evaluation this morning. I checked in our database. For the moment, we don't have any standard, but that's the beauty of the modern technology. I immediately contacted Paris, and I told them, look, there is an interest here. Maybe this should be investigated. Uh, we also work on invasive alien plants and on biological control agents. Um, we do this in this area. What do we do? We mainly develop and adopt regional technical, technical standards, which are recommendations to our member countries. We also disseminate information. This is one of the functions listed in our convention through information services and databases. And last but not least, uh, one important activity of EPO is to organize meetings, so panel, workshop, conferences. And with that, we think it's very important that we, we facilitate networking in our region. So we allow experts to meet together in their area of expertise, and that's a way of facilitating networking. And that's very, for me, that's quite an, a key activity of our organization. So uh, some words about standard setting in EPO. So it's a long-standing activity, and we have an active program in uh, standard setting, uh, including diagnostics. Uh, the objective is to harmonize uh, the approach to detection and identification for regulated pests. And this work started in 1998, so nearly 20 years ago. It's conducted by panels, so group of experts, specialists in their countries, which are nominated to be panel members. Uh, we have a standard, our standard setting process uh, involves uh, that standards are, for most of them, written according to a common format and content. So. Um, the experts preparing the standard have to follow that format. Uh, the first drafts uh, are produced by individual experts or for more complex standards by a drafting team. And recently we are going more and more for drafting teams because sometimes we need experts in morphology, 
and also experts in molecular diagnostics. So we are now more and more working with drafting teams. Once a draft is prepared, it is reviewed by the panel, so the group of specialists, and then when they are considered ready, they are following a standard approval procedure which is presented on the side of the slide. So you can see here our standard setting procedure. Uh, the standards, when they are approved, so they are sent through a, a written consultation to all NPPOs, and as you can see, the NPPOs um, may consult their specialists in their country. So it's not, it, it, it should go beyond the NPPO. The standards are when they are approved, published in the EPO bulletin, and they are all freely available. So you can access them through the EPO bulletin or through uh, our global database, which uh, is mentioned here. Um, Xilela. So Xilela uh, was first approved in 2003 and published in 2004. But at that time, it was really very focused on vitis and citrus. And so we decided in 2015, uh, after a, a meeting of the panel on diagnostic in bacteriology, that, of course, it needed to be revised. We then formed an expert working group with uh, experts in uh, Xylella fastidiosa diagnostic from Austria, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Slovenia, and Spain. And then we also received contribution from the US and Brazil. And so the work of the, the revision work started in December 2015 and continued up to March 2016. As you've seen during this one and a half day, that's not the easiest space to work on when you want to prepare a diagnostic protocol. Subspecies, vectors, many host plants, so when you speak about validation of tests, that's a real headache. So this is really something you have to keep in mind. You cannot validate the test on all possible hosts. Uh, usually when we do validation for simpler uh, pests, we do a matrix, the target organism, and then we determine the performance criteria. Here we are in a most more difficult case. Anyway, that was the challenge of the expert working group and we've tried to, to give more information in the revision. For example, we've included a lot of pictures on possible symptoms. And these pictures are also included in two other standards that have been produced in parallel about inspection. Inspection of consignment and inspection of places of production. So in fact, for Xilela, three standards were developed in parallel. We also provide more detail on sample preparation that, than was before. So I don't want you to read this table. It's going to be available later with a, with a presentation, and of course it's in our standard. What I want to highlight here is that asymptomatic plant is still tricky, and so we, are still, uh, we, we still need more uh, data from research on asymptomatic plant testing, but it's not unique to Xylella. It's really a, a common problem we have in diagnostic, how to sample for asymptomatic plants. The new tests that have been included for detection, so we had the, already ELISA in the previous version. We've added IF and a direct tissue blot immunoassay. For molecular tests, the only test included uh, in the first version where was a conventional PCR from Min Savage, and we've added a real -time, two real-time PCR and a lamp test. So the serological tests are only recommended for plant material, not for insects. The molecular tests are recommended both for plants and vectors. The different, why do we have so many type of tests? It's because we want to take into account the different situation in the EPO region. We, have, we are 51 country, and, and so we want that the, the different situation are covered in our protocols. 
We also have in this protocol the subspecies assignation, so in the current version, MLST and some conventional PCR, uh, Puller, Artung, and Hernandez Martinez. And unlike other protocols for bacteria, we don't recommend isolation as a screening test for this one. Um, regarding validation data uh, for the tests that are included in the protocol, there is some validation data available in the standard itself, but additional data is also available in a database uh, where we encourage our uh, laboratories to provide validation data and enter validation data. Um, we have a flow diagram, two flow diagrams uh, to guide uh, the diagnostic process. So one for plants and one for the vectors. So for example here, you have uh, the start of the process with the screening, including serological tests and conventional real-time PCR and LAMP. And then depending on the result of the tests, uh, you have uh, an, a further decision to make on isolation. Um, there are some guidance, there is some guidance given uh, regarding the use of uh, serological tests. And so in the EPO protocol, we recommend serological tests um, for areas, outbreak areas, and on symptomatic plants. For the other areas, we recommend molecular tests. Uh, how did it work? So the protocol was prepared, I told you already, between December and March 2016. It was sent in early April to all our NPPOs. I just forgot to mention that for revision of diagnostic protocol, we have a, what we call a, a fast-track procedure uh, here that uh, involves the same step at the start of the process, but then after we have a quicker possibility for adoption of revision. So the test, the new text was prepared by the expert working group. It was sent for country consultation between April, um, between March, sorry, and April uh, 2016. And then the comments were considered during a meeting of the panel on diagnostic in bacteriology and after that meeting, it was sent for written consultation for formal objection. So a formal objection is a country saying, sorry, you cannot have this protocol adopted. We object to this or this part. Um, so the revision was prepared in May. It was then sent for country consultation again. And on the 15th of July 2016, sorry, it was approved and published online in 2016 September. I'm, I'm, I don't want to go back in time. I'm, I'm just in 2017. So it's 16, sorry for that mistake. Um, the current version of the protocol was mainly based on experience and validation data from the different laboratories in the region. And we were very conscious that a lot of research was going on and um, a new information would quickly be available to prepare a revision of this protocol. So what we've done is that we already said upon adoption to the panel, we will prepare a revision quite soon. And we decided in uh, our meeting um, in uh, 2017 in May that we should send, uh, we should prepare a revision in order to incorporate uh, the, in the revision the results of research and to ensure that the DP is as up to date as possible. Um, I'd like to show you something that we have in the diagnosis, in every single diagnostic protocol. So we say if you have any feedback concerning this diagnostic protocol or any test included, or if you can provide additional validation data for tests included in this protocol that you wish to share, please contact diagnostics at epo.ent. So that's a possibility for anybody to send us a question or make some suggestion. Um, 
it's not very well used. I don't know if it's, if it's because it's buried in the text of the protocol, but um, so that's an option to make comments and make suggestion on diagnostic protocols. So as I said, a lot has happened. So there have been many national projects on Zilela, but I will now focus on the projects that have been mostly used to prepare the revision. So we have two UFRESCO projects, so one on harmonized protocol for monitoring and detection of Xylella fastidiosa in its host plant and vector, PROMODE, with 23 research organizations in our region. And the objective was sampling method, sensitive detection in host and vectors, and interlaboratory validation. I will not disclose uh, the, the result on, on that project, except that we, they have been <coughs> two proficiency tests organized in 2017, one which is finished and the other one which is under progress at the moment. And Juliana will explain the result of the first one. Uh, the other project is on the insect vectors, and again, sampling method, real-time PCR, improvement of the LAM test, and validation of non-destructive DNA extraction method. And so that, uh, that project um, is still going on. So it involves 10 research organizations. And of course, X Factors and Ponte, two projects funded by the EU and with specific work package for diagnostics. And of course, there is a lot of interaction between UFRESCO project, national project, X Factors and Ponte and so this was um, the result of this project have been, um, the, the first result of this project have been looked at the panel we had in May where we discussed the revision of the diagnostic protocol. Uh, we discussed it in Bari in uh, May this year and the first result of the TPS were presented. And the panel, when reviewing uh, the, the need for revision, considered that it broadly serves the needs of the lab, but there are some critical points. One being the difficulty to isolate the bacterium, and the second was the determination of the subspecies, and in particular, when you're only dealing with plant extracts. And so the decision made, the recommendation made by the panel at that time was that the expert working group should be reactivated. So the one uh, which first prepared the revision um, that is currently the, that is the current version. And that we should include new experts from X Factor and Ponte project to ensure that the research results are included. So we had a first meeting in September 2017. So not long ago, so it was a two-day meeting with experts from France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, and we had another meeting on Sunday evening, uh, just before the, the conference, where we had experts from Belgium, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and also experts from the US. Uh, and again, the proposal for revision made are based on the data gathered by the experts through the different projects. So first of all, how can we, what can we do about the isolation? So it's, we know it's a difficult bacterium to isolate and uh, there is good experience in Spain and in the Netherlands about the addition of a sonication step before plating. So in the new version of the protocol, we are proposing the addition of that step. Uh, Thanks to the test performance study organized, uh, we realized that uh, there could be issues with the implementation of the quick peek in manual use. And so that we should give more guidance to experts when they are extracting DNA using the quick peek in a manual mode. So that will be done. Uh, regarding the real-time PCR screening tests, uh, the expert discussed the real-time the real-time PCR of Harper, and they concluded that it has a higher sensitive analytical sensitivity than uh, Francis et al. And on the top, the, tech, the, the Francis et al. does not detect some American strains. So now the recommendation is first to use real-time Harper first. Uh, we'll come back to Harper in a few minutes. 
And then we had a, a comment. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware that there is an international protocol prepared by the IPPC uh, on xylella fastidiosa, which was sent for country consultation during this summer. And this diagnostic protocol includes the tests that we use in the region, but in addition, it includes a test a real time from Li et al 2013. And so the question came, why don't we have this real time in our diagnostic protocol? Our first answer was simple. We don't have any experience with it. So that's the reason why it's not included. But then uh, in X Factor, Ponte, and New Fresco, uh, the colleagues, the experts said, well, we can try to organize a comparison and an evaluation, and, and then we will have the data to include it or not to include it. So it's underway. Uh, thanks to Maria, uh, who, who has taken uh, this extra job, and uh, so we will have an evaluation of this real-time PCR. Uh, the assignment of isolate to subspecies, which is very important uh, in the European context. So we, we, knew, we, ha we knew that there were difficulties to assign subspecies with MLST on plant extract. And so, because some genes are not amplified and you have a lack of applicants to be sequenced, and also because the different host plants are producing incomplete allelic profiles, so we have now proposed to another, another option, which is the sequencing of at least two housekeeping genes. And also there was a practical problem, which is that uh, with the MLST, you have an ST, but you don't have immediately the subspecies. So we've now added a table of correspondence between ST and subspecies in the revised protocol. The difficulty also with MLST on different hosts and mixed infection was also discussed during that meeting. And then some proposals are made to optimize uh, the MLST when you have erratic result. And so I'm not going through them, but that's a proposal made in, uh, in the new revision of the diagnostic protocol. And then the multiplex PCR from Hernandez Martinez, it was already written in the protocol that you should not use it on plant extract, but we make it even more clear because there seem to be some time um, some problems, but you should not use it on plant extracts. In the, the meeting of Sunday, so basically uh, the changes proposed by the expert working group were broadly accepted. There are some changes in the wording, but nothing essential. So the recommendation made have been accepted. And then we were lucky to have um, a Eufresco meeting just after, uh, convened by Peter Bunans. And uh, during that meeting, uh, there were extra discussion. In particular, the fact that with ARPER, uh, you can have in rare cases, or in some cases, CT values that are late CT values observed. And so we are now discussing what we should do with this information and if we need to put a warning in the diagnostic protocol with some recommendations on how to deal with such situations. Uh, we've heard about a new triplex PCR uh, which has been developed and, and could be considered in a further revision because it, has, uh, it needs further validation. And also, uh, Marie Agnès will um, speak about it, but she mentioned uh, that a nested PCR has been developed. So you see, there's always, uh, we really need to get the information. And I, I also heard about, you know, this duplex PCR in Belgium. So we we are gathering what is uh, being done at the moment um, in order to see what could be considered for inclusion and improvement of the protocol. Um, the next steps, ideally country consultation in early 2018 to take into account the result of the TPS on insect and the lietal, adoption before summer, and then straight away planning the revision, the next one because there are still <coughs> points to be improved in the protocol. Sampling of asymptomatic material, testing of vectors, additional validation data, a new kit is under evaluation at the moment, a new kit from Agdia, Agdia is uh, present here. Um, and then the inclusion of NGS, the nested PCR. 
And we also need to work on a standard on the identification of vectors because we've had requests on that. But that's another panel, that's a panel on entomology. So as a conclusion, I would say research projects are essential for standard setting. We are in need of information to improve our standards, to develop validate tests, to optimize tests, or to produce additional validation data. But also we've seen that with the test performance study to ensure that the laboratories implement the test as expected. So that's quite important. Or also training. So I know there will be training in the framework of the other project. <laughs> I'd like to thank all these people because they've been involved at a stage or another to the preparation of the revision and the new revision. So the green one are the newcomers. Uh, the black ones are the first drafting team. Uh, the red ones are the experts from outside the region. So a big thank you because EPO is a secretariat. So what we achieve is only because we have expert, keen, and willing to collaborate with us to prepare the standards for the region. Thank you for your attention. So this was a very clear presentation and also perfectly in time, on the minute. Okay, so we now switch to uh, the second presentation <clears throat> on the first international proficiency testing uh, on Silella fastidiosa uh, in the different laboratories, presented by Giuliana Proconsole from Bari. Um, yes. Um, hello, everybody. And um, uh, this interlaboratory um, comparison is part of uh, research activities on the implementation uh, for uh, the surveillance and uh, monitoring program for Xelella Fastidiosa uh, in the framework of uh, the ongoing project, uh, European ongoing projects, uh, Ponte, X Factors, and Eufresco. Um, a proficiency test is a way to evaluate uh, and assess the competence of one or more laboratories. Uh, in, the, in the proficiency test, standardized samples with known status regarding uh, the presence of a target pathogen are sent out to participating laboratories. Uh, then laboratories use their uh, instrument, equipment, and reagent to perform the test. And uh, the organizer analyzes the results of the laboratories and provides a final, report, um, rep, a final report detailing all participant results in confidential manner. The objective of a proficiency test, it could be an help uh, for a laboratory to improve its quality. Uh, it could be used by customer or a regulatory body for the selection of qualified laboratories. Um, it could be a means to um, verify the laboratory's capabilities and the accuracy of the analysis uh, to take corrective action to achieve a better performance. In the, um, in the months of February and April of 2016, uh, 17, uh, sorry, uh, a proficiency test was organized by um, uh, CNR of Bari and University of Bari with the support of ANSES to um, evaluate the competence of uh, uh, laboratories to perform molecular and serological diagnosis for Xalella fastidiosa. Um, 35 uh, laboratories participating from 18 European non-European countries. And the main objective was to evaluate the performance expressed as efficiency accuracy of uh, laboratories involved in the, in the diagnosis of Xylella fastidiosa by serological and molecular assay on a panel of blind samples. It was also an educational training for those labs that had never approached the detection of uh, Xylella fastidiosa using some of the protocol uh, evaluated in this PT. Uh, these are um, in the slides the, the timelines of uh, these uh, proficiency tests from the preparation of samples uh, which uh, were stored at minus 20 to uh, the production of a preliminary report uh, which was shared and discussed uh, with uh, the EPO panel on diagnostic and bacteriology at the end of May. And uh, at uh, the end of July, um, a final report was produced with uh, the suggestion of the EPO panel. 
The laboratory selected these diagnostic procedures uh, um, uh, the, for the molecular test, the um, uh, real time, the qPCR or reported by Harper, and uh, the uh, conventional PCR reported by Min Savage. Um, uh, for the DNA extraction methods, uh, laboratories uh, selected the uh, protocol adopted routinely in uh, their labs um, as uh, the CTAB extraction methods or the extraction with the American food kit, or uh, by quick pick plant kit, or by uh, the Agnesi plant mini kit. Um, however, organizer um, uh, preferred to uh, supply the, the protocols uh, because, uh, in, uh, because in for, uh, for some uh, laboratories, this is, was the first time that they performed uh, the diagnosis on Xylella fastidiosa. And uh, also, um, uh, 13 laboratories selected ELISA test with two uh, kits commercially available. Uh, the panel of experimental samples uh, consisted of uh, plant sap fr obtained from olive leaf specials uh, prepared depending on the different methods under evaluation, uh, contaminated spiked with uh, a bacterial suspension of uh, some Codiro strain at three different concentrations, uh, 10 to 6, 10 to 5, and 10 to 4. Um, also, this, uh, the panel uh, in the panel was included were included randomized xylella free preparation. Uh, homogeneity and stability were assessed for all the diagnostic procedures included uh, in the PT, um, and uh, they were performed on three replicates for each type of, uh, of samples. And uh, stability tests were conducted uh, once all the laboratories had completed their test. And based on the, um, of the analysis of quantitative and qualitative results, all the samples were considered to be uh, sufficiently homogeneous and stable uh, for all the methods and uh, uh, suitable to evaluate the lab performance. Analysis of the results was primarily based on the analysis of qualitative data. Uh, laboratory assigned uh, uh, to each samples um, uh, as positive, negative, or undetermined. And uh, organizer um, um, calculated the positive and negative agreement, the positive and negative deviation, to uh, calculate after the performance criteria. Uh, the performance of each lab was expressed uh, with uh, the accuracy, uh, which is uh, the closeness between the laboratory results and the assigned value, and uh, it includes the diagnostic sensitivity and the diagnostic specificity. And also, uh, the other parameter wa was the repeatability. The proficiency was expressed as percentage, with 100% being the most performance level. Also, quantitative result, uh, results were recorded. Uh, based on the values of, uh, of accuracy, the laboratories were categorized as highly proficient with 100% of accuracy, uh, and this was the case of the laboratories that obtained all the expected positive and negative uh, results. Or, or profit category of proficient or with a level of accuracy of 90 to 100 percent, with one positive or one negative deviation. Non proficient with a level of accuracy uh, less than 90 percent, uh, with one more than positive deviation or negative deviation. The declaration of conformity to the proficiency test was assigned to highly proficient and proficient labs. Uh, this is the performance criteria recovered in the different laboratories for the QPCR. It is evident that uh, all labs uh, was, uh, reached the uh, level of accuracy of 100% and thus they were uh, categorized as highly proficient and conformed to DPT. Only for the quick peak, we, uh, we have 10 laboratories highly proficient, one laboratory is proficient, and one 
uh, non proficient because uh, um, probably because they performed as Francois Petter uh, said before um, per, per, uh, performed manually using a magnet pipette the, the protocol. Uh, the best uh, performance of uh, the laboratory uh, occurred with the, the, pla the automated platform. Um, this, uh, in the slides, the performance criteria recovered for the different laboratories for the conventional PCR. The majority. Um, sorry. Oops. Sorry. Um, the majority of the um, uh, of the, lab uh, the majority of the laboratory um, resulted uh, highly proficient and proficient for the PCR. However, uh, some laboratories failed the detection of uh, the bacterium in the sample with the lowest concentration of the bacterium. The, of the bacterium. For uh, the CTAB method, American food uh, extraction and quick pick. And uh, uh, again, for the quick pick, quick this, this uh, laboratory performed manually the protocol using a magnet pipette or a rack. Um, the same performance criteria were covered in 13 laboratories for the LISA test using the two different commercial kits. And uh, uh, in general, uh, um, uh, we obtained a, a lower number of um, uh, proficient, highly proficient laboratories than uh, the number of, the the, of laboratories with uh, performed molecular test. Uh, because in many uh, laboratories, many laboratories fail the detection of the bacterium in the sample uh, with the lowest concentration of the bacterium. However, if we consider only the results obtained for the samples with the, uh, the, uh, con the, the, the higher concentration of the bacterium, all laboratories were proficient with an accuracy of 100%. An overview of the performance of uh, different laboratories and the percentage of conformant and not conformant laboratory to the proficient test for each method. Three important comments. Uh, for QPCR assay, uh, despite the use of different methods of extraction and, and different QPCR master mix, the totality of the laboratories uh, that performed the detection resulted, uh, resulted proficient, with one exception for the quick pick. Uh, in relation to the PCR assay, the highest number of non-proficient lab occurred when uh, using the quick pick for the extraction of DNA as a consequence of the use of the magnet pipette and uh, to the fact that some laboratories uh, have no experience to use this kit. However, and, um, in addition, the lower sensitivity of the ELISA test compared to the molecular test in this PT could be uh, depends on several parameters that, uh, uh, which have an influ um, that may influence the performance of the laboratories. Use of different plates, different volumes loaded on the plate, artificially contaminated samples different from fresh infected samples. Uh, in conclusion, the PT provided a good overview on the laboratory performance for the diagnostic currently used in the Mediterranean country. And the results uh, indicate that using the most sensitive and most widely adopted diagnostic protocol, the laboratory's performance was very satisfactory. At the same time, um, uh, useful uh, insights were obtained to achieve a better performance for the satisfactory laboratories. When this PT was concluded, uh, we decided to simulate a test performance study uh, on the analysis of the results of the molecular assay obtained by labs that performed proficiently in the previous proficient test. Thus, in the table, the um, method selected based on the declared uh, conformed uh, laboratory. Uh, for the TPS, uh, we analyzed the same parameters, and in addition, the reproducibility, and we recorded the quantitative results. 
Uh, as the graphs show, um, uh, they, um, uh, for, uh, for a QPCR, PCR, Q, Q, quantitative PCR, PCR, conventional PCR assay, consistently resulted in performance value of sensitivity, specificity, uh, repeatability, reproducibility, and accuracy in the range of 97, 100%. And it is a very high uh, range. This is for the other um, parameters. Uh, based on, on the analysis of quantitative data, um, uh, uh, the, the analysis of quantitative data showed that delta CQ among the dilution corresponded to the expected value about three, and the QPCR reaction efficiency was in the range, in the optimal range of 90 and 110 percent. However, um, the uh, standard deviation among the CQ values recovered in the different laboratories were affected by the use of different QPCR conditions, and uh, the lowest CQ value were obtained with the DNA recovered using CTAB followed by the Kia Generic Food Kit. Conclusion? Okay. Yes, uh, despite the use of different amplification conditions, and uh, master mix used um, um, that, uh, by simulating a TPS among the proficient labs, optimal performance values were obtained, confirming the robustness and reproducibility of the molecular methods tested and uh, their uh, suitability for the diagnosis of cellella fastidiosa and plant materials. As Francois Petter said, um, interlaboratory validation are not yet finished. Uh, uh, is ongoing and TPS on molecular detection of cellella fastidiosa through quanti um, quantitative viral time PCR assay, five different, five different format of, of QPCR assay uh, here listed on the DNA extracts prepared in the framework of the previous uh, PT. And uh, uh, another TPS is ongoing on, organized by ANSES on uh, DNA extraction method, the molecular uh, methods reported by EPO um, for the detection of uh, Xylella fastidiosa on vectors. Uh, the samples are uh, consist, consisted in uh, spiked insect macerate obtained with Xylella free Philenus pumarius and naturally infected Philenus pumarius. I want uh, thanks to uh, the three European projects uh, which gave us the opportunity to um, uh, organize this interlaboratory comparison, uh, which involved uh, such a large number of laboratories, um, the EPO Secretariat and the EPO Panel on Diagnostic Bacteriology for this suggestion, uh, the colleagues of ANSES uh, will support us uh, to, um, uh, for the analysis uh, of the data, and all the 35 participating laboratories. Thank you. Now is the stage uh, to Maria Bersma Vlami, uh, who will talk about the sampling procedure for early detection of the bacterium in asymptomatic plants. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, EFSA and the local organizers for uh, uh, organizing this very interesting meeting and providing the opportunity to discuss some of the results of our work, uh, which have been performed inside the XF Factors project. Um, my presentation uh, has two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will discuss with you uh, the uh, work we have performed inside subtask 4.2.1, uh, uh, dealing with the identification of um, uh, candidate indicator plants, also named as spy plants, in our case only in confined conditions, so in greenhouses or in post-entry quarantine conditions, which could support uh, the early detection of Xylella fastidiosa. And the second part deals with the development of appropriate sampling in cases of asymptomatic, latently infected with Xylella fastidiosa plant material, uh, and then more concentrated in imported ornamental plants or in cases of uh, nursery plant material. Um, the indicator plants, so the subtask 4.2.1, uh, um, we have chosen for these experiments in our lab seven uh, different plant species. 
Uh, we have two annual, the Nicotiana Tabacum and Catharanthus roseus, which are also through uh, via literature known as very good uh, experimental plants. Then we have uh, uh, five different perennial uh, plants, Coffee Arabica, starting from seedlings, Neri Moleander, Polyhalum Britifolia, and, uh, and two different uh, individual Prunus species, namely Prunus avium and Prunus uh, uh, domestica. And the last, these two last uh, plant species actually they are the only deciduous plant species in this list. Um, the isolates we included for the inoculations, uh, for the work we've done uh, on this uh, indicator or spy plants, included two isolates which we isolated from coffee arabica plants uh, in the Netherlands in a consignment in 2015. Uh, they are the isolates uh, PD7202 and PD7211. Both of them belong to uh, Xylella fastidiosa pauca. And they were found in both cases in individual coffee arabica plants, which uh, showed no symptoms whatever. Um, for these two isolates, uh, the isolation was succeeded after an extra, an additional step of ultrasonication of uh, the plant extract we acquired at that time. Um, we performed some classical bacteriological tests in this case, so we knew that uh, they were gram negatives, that they gave a negative oxidase reaction and a positive catalase reaction. And we tested the uh, sequence type based on the MLSC scheme of one et al. in 2010 uh, in plant extract, but also on the individual isolates. And we found that uh, uh, these uh, isolates belonged to uh, sequence type 53 and sequence type 73. So actually, they differed among them in uh, three individual uh, loci. Um, as a positive control, we included a different strain, uh, a reference strain we acquired from the LMG collection that was the original uh, strain from USA from uh, Vitisks, uh, belonging to Xylella fastidiosa fastidiosa. Um, and in all cases, we acquired the inoculum we used for the inoculations in these experiments from uh, uh, plates, from colonies grown in plates. In our case, comparable to the results from Italy, uh, a bit longer, so we had to wait up to three and a half weeks to uh, succeed in uh, enough inoculum production. Um, and we test in all cases uh, the um, um, actually the density uh, as expressed in CT value of the suspension prepared for the inoculation experiments by Harper PCR. So we knew for bo both isolates the range of the CT values acquired for the performed experiments. Um, we performed only mechanical inoculations in these experiments in the Netherlands. So uh, no vector whatever is involved uh, here for uh, transmission via vector uh, of Xylella fastidiosa. Um, this experiment describes in first instance the uh, two prunus species, uh, the Polyhala and the Nerium oleander. Uh, namely, the two prunus species were a little bit older trees, uh, uh, more than one year old. Um, we performed the inoculations per individual plant in three uh, places. I am afraid you don't see it very, very well, but this uh, traditional uh, paper labels are marked the place of uh, inoculation in these three, in, in three individual places. And additional for the prunus and for the nerium oleander, because they were the, more, the most um, older um, uh, plant species used, we also performed a mechanical injury of the uh, plants in the stem, simply by cutting the outside uh, uh, part of the stem and injecting directly in the xylem uh, some suspension of xylella fastidiosa. Um, uh, and I have to say that uh, in all cases we performed repeated inoculations. So for these two prunus species and for the uh, Neri Moleander, the Polyhala, we had three rounds of inoculations. Among these rounds, uh, we had some weeks time uh, between the first and the second and the third inoculation. Um, two individual experiments were performed um, in two different greenhouse compartments, although conditions were kept at the same in both individual experiments. So we speak about 28 degrees during day and 21 during, day, uh, during night time and also uh, quite uh, uh, low relative humidity of 50%. Uh, 
Um, and the experiments were, had also a seasonal variation effect. So the first inoculation in the F15 uh, compartment was performed during the spring of 2017, actually the beginning of the spring, and the second experiment in the different compartment was performed later in the beginning of the autumn. Um, somehow, uh, um, about 10 weeks after the inoculation, in the spring inoculation, so the very first inoculations we performed, we observed some symptoms which were quite typical uh, for Xylella fastidiosa on Prunus avium, on all the plants of Prun Prunus avium included, only on one of the two strains from coffee. That is the PD strain 7202 of uh, sequence type 53. The same or similar results we observed from the uh, reference strain, so the Xylella fastidiosa fastidiosa from Vitis, uh, from uh, the States. However, not on the strain 7211 or the negative control. However, when we went to uh, uh, analyze some samples from, the, uh, uh, from these plants with PCR, we got actually with the Harvard PCR quite high CT values, what Francois earlier explained in his presentation. So we were about uh, above uh, 37 and 38 uh, uh, CT value for the Harvard PCR for these samples from Prunus avium inoculated with 7202. Um, the preliminary results uh, from the first, uh, uh, um, actually, um, uh, sampling on these plants highlighted, and I don't explain the whole tape, but I go to the most important part, it highlights that for this isolate, and this is the sequence type 53, um, Polyhala mirtifolia, Nerium oleander, and some of the Prunus domestica gave, uh, in some cases, or in most cases, relatively low uh, CT values with Harbor PCR. However, in the case of the other isolates, so the sequence type 73, at that time point of 21 weeks after the first inoculation and five weeks after the second inoculation, we did not find any positive results. And how these um, uh, symptoms, because we saw several symptoms, not in all plants, but in several cases, look like, you see here the polyhala mirtifolia, 21 weeks after inoculation, we got some leaf scorching, some chlorosis, on oleander, we only found chlorotic leaves. And in Prunus domestica, we also found some kind of leaf scorching, although not in all cases, very, very typical. Um, then the second uh, uh, um, uh, sampling on the same plants, we see that a few weeks later, so at week 25, we got positive results, uh, positive detection of Xylella fastidiosa, also with the second isolate included. Not in all cases, but on the uh, oleander and on the uh, polyhala mirtifolia. And at the same time, the plants found previously, the previous round of, uh, um, of sampling for the other isolates, uh, other isolate, they were positive as well. Um, the, uh, here is some photograph to show you the symptoms we observed for the isolate of sequence type uh, 73 on polyhala mitifolia at this time of sampling, so 25 weeks uh, post inoculation. Um, the conclusions so far, because again these are preliminary conclusions, include that uh, during the spring inoculation with this isolate 7202 of uh, 53 sequence time, we see that we can detect earlier than when in the case of the second isolate of sequence type 73. Um, however, we have to mention that repeated inoculations are required. That is our experience so far. And that Xylella fastidiosa could earlier uh, have been uh, observed and detected in the Nerium oleander and Polyhala mirtifolia, uh, and in some cases on the Domestica, but not in Prunus avium. Um, then in the autumn uh, uh, Inoculations, I have very, uh, the very first results, six weeks post-inoculation, and then you see that uh, this is a little bit the other way around, at least there is a tendency, we don't know yet if it's for sure, but it looks like it, that here the, uh, seven, the strain 7211 of sequence type 73 gives in first instance the most positive detections, although in some cases we are above uh, a CT value of 37. Um, then for the coffee, we had in a period of about 10 months uh, repeat inoculations, four rounds in total, and 
the results we acquired for the same two isolates uh, for different plants. And here I just say, uh, I want to tell you that we have plants inoculated two, three, or four times per isolate. Um, in all cases, for both isolates and uh, in different inoculation uh, rounds, we could uh, find Xylella fastidiosa back on these coffee plants. Um, in general, the symptoms look like this. So we had the negative uh, uh, control of the coffee plants, and in general, we saw chlorosis of the leaves which were inoculated, independent of which isolate. However, if you looked more careful, you really had to look for it. You could find some beginning symptoms, like here above, of uh, leaf scorching, and I have uh, two more pictures of that. So here above, and in this case, as well, you see some more um, uh, disease on the leaves. But they were, they were not on, on all, the leaf, all the leaves and all the plants. So it was not, let's say, the case where you can generalize this effect. Um, one more minute, okay, yes. Um, then I will just go very, very fast, okay. Um, uh, and then I will describe very fast about the um, second uh, subtask. We performed uh, uh, some um, work uh, in order to be able, and we have only preliminary results on that, uh, uh, to improve our sampling scheme. So we actually, what we did, we uh, uh, determined the plant weight uh, of uh, individual leaves. We made uh, extracts of it and we spiked. And we used three different, uh, three different plants, which were included also in the other experiments. Uh, inoculated, um, spiked with these uh, strains, uh, dilutions made, and actually the first results we have in this case for the Nerium oleander uh, involves that um, we could find the uh, Xylella fastidiosa uh, back, uh, independent of which isolate was included, up to uh, 10 and a half to 13 and a half individual leaves. And this was colorated uh, with uh, 2.1 to 2.3 gram of used leaf. And that was the petiole with the mid uh, rib used for the analysis. Uh, comparable results we had also for the coffee. Uh, in that case, we used the number of leaves used for the analysis was much higher. So we uh, found the positive uh, results between the 31 and a half and the 40 and a half uh, leaves. And uh, if you dilute further, you cannot find Xylella fastidiosa anymore. Um, and I have to go uh, very back, so I will skip this one. Uh, our conclusions so far are concerning these uh, uh, experiments, and namely the second part, so the sampling schemes, are that uh, we could, based on this experimental part, simulate uh, a sort of a simul uh, simultaneously, uh, simultaneous um, uh, increase of decrease of the inoculum of Xylella fastidiosa and the increase of the sampling volume, so the number of leaves per individual plant species used for the analysis. Um, and based on this approach so far, for these preliminary results, we can say that for the individual uh, plant species used, we have differences in the number of leaves used. However, this correlates so far in this first experiment performed more or less the same amount in terms of fresh weight used material for the analysis of uh, between uh, uh, 2.1 uh, 2 and 2.7. Um, which will be the implication exactly uh, of these schemes, because we have to repeat results, we have really to, uh, to go further with the analysis in these kind of schemes, is not really known. However, what is known is that probably we'll, we will need to increase the uh, um, number of subsamples in order to fulfill the requirements for sampling in uh, asymptomatic plant species. And having this sent, I would like to thank you for your attention and to thank, of course, the X Factors project and the colleagues in the lab which used, which worked very hard for this work, namely uh, Karen Helderman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So we are coming to the third, to the one, two, three, fourth speaker of this afternoon, uh, Marianne Jacques from INRA France, improving the typing of Xylella directly from plant material. So, hello everybody. 
I want to thank the EFSA and the organizers for giving me the opportunity today to present the results of uh, our work. So, as it was already mentioned several times during this conference, and as you know all, it is time consuming and most often not very easy, quite difficult to obtain isolates of xylella fastidiosa from pan samples. And this is a consequence of an intrinsic poor isolation rate and also a consequence of the fastidious nature of the pathogens. So uh, being able to directly type xylella fastidiosa from plant sample is really a priority for epidemiological purposes. It was previously shown that xylella dispersed between countries but also between continents via contaminated plant material that most of the time is asymptomatic. And locally, the contact between strains can generate recombinants that present novel capabilities, capacities as the capacities to infect novel plant species. So in consequence, in order to decipher the evolutionary history of the pathogens and to identify the roots of invasion, it is very highly important to use fine typing methods that have low detection threshold. So for us, in order to finally survey the dynamic of xylella fastidiosa lineages in France, and to decipher the roots of invasion of these pathogens and the way it disperses, we try to improve the typing methods we are using. So as you know, MLST is usually run on isolated strain. However, direct typing was also developed from some fastidious human pathogens, such as Leptospira, Burkholderia, and Trichomonas. These are fastidious pathogens. And in these studies, the idea was to reuse MLST scheme, which are supported by public website, not to impair the comparability of the results and not to lose data. So in these studies, it was observed that the limitation of the direct MLST was the requirement of a high bacterial load in the plant material. But in all these studies, that the nested approach could however bypass this limitation with a substantial improvement in the detection threshold. And it was also observed some limited success with only partial profile, but this was not the most often cases. And also in all these studies, and this is very important on an epidemiological point of view, it was observed that uh, uh, quite a number of, sample, of samples were co-infected by several lineages, and that was not previously uh, known. So what about the direct typing of xylella uh, from plant material in France? So here I remind you some uh, figures. So in 2015, among 531 samples that were declared contaminated by xylella, <clears throat> uh, 33, no, 431 samples were typed. However, 25% of them couldn't be completely typed. At least one housekeeping gene was not properly sequenced. In 2016, the number of incomplete typing reaches 52%, um, and in 2017, it was 20%. So, of course, the number of plant species that were tested in all these years varied from time to time. So the direct typing of xylella from plant material remains to be improved. So what can be the causes of these incomplete typings? So it was mentioned before that uh, xylella can be present with a very low bacterial level in plants and, could al and is also usually non-uniformly distributed. So this can be bypassed by sampling, bulking, or concentrated uh, plant material. 
However, there are also some uh, technical uh, problems that, for which we can have technical solutions. So, for example, and it was mentioned before, the efficiency of the DNA extraction methods depends on plant matrices. Some have a lot of polysaccharides of polyphenol that could uh, interact with the DNA or could act also with P uh, as PCR inhibitors. And this is quite uh, frequent in some matrices such as olive tree, but also oak, cystus, or curry plants, or lavender. And also in typing, we use conventional PCR that have a quite low sensitivity, but also have uh, some variable PCR yields, depending on the genes. So <clears throat> we choose to test various options to increase the direct typing from plant material. We compared, uh, following the proficiency test, the quick pick and CTAB uh, extraction on the various plant species we had. And we also compare polymerases. And finally, we questioned the PCR that, uh, from the MLST uh, scheme that we are using. And so we ended in the redesign of some MLST primers and also in the design of a nested MLST scheme. So first, here I will present the results of the comparison of the quick peak extraction method in two labs that differed in the use of robots. And uh, one lab also had a sonication step that was mentioned before to favor the isolation of the bacterium following the paper of uh, Maria. But we added also to favor the release of DNA. And so we can see here, we all these plants plant material that was tested were symptomatic. I don't know if it's clear for you, but here you have some quite uh, typical symptoms on these uh, various plant material that represent 37 plant species. And so <clears throat> using this uh, quick pick DNA, but with various uh, uh, va variants, in lab A, we got 16 positive samples, whereas seven were determined in the other lab. And a high number of samples were uh, declared undetermined, so with a very high CT between 35 and 40 in lab A, whereas in lab B, a high number of samples were declared negative. So most of the samples that we analyzed were contaminated, but certainly with quite low bacterial levels and also for most of these plant species, certainly present some PCR inhibitors that ended in very high CT values that were translated by the indetermined results of the PCR. So now if you, on these various plant species, compare the quick pick and the CTAB methods, you can see that the value you obtained are quite similar. But if you are going more in details, you can see that you can have some false negative uh, results. So here, it's only two samples that were declared positive with CTAB, but negative with quick pick. But you also have some samples that uh, switch from undetermined to positive using some methods. So this is interesting because using both extraction methods of these samples, you increase, of course, the number of plants that are declared contaminated. So for us, as matrices are diverse and the bacterial levels are low to medium, we favor the use of uh, com these two complementary methods to extract DNA. And then, Concerning the MLST, if you have a look on the various primers that were designed and that are very efficient if you are using this uh, amplification methods on isolates, but prove a little bit less efficient for direct typing, we can see that the TM of some of the primers is quite high, 
but also it is unbalanced. For example, for the GLTT gene, you have a high difference in the TM, TM of the forward and the reverse uh, primer. So this can be improved. And also you have high heart instability that using primer three are declared as unacceptable parameters. So we redesigned this primer to try to improve the efficiency of this uh, various amplification. And we did get some uh, better yields for some uh, genes, but this was not consistent for all the, um, the genes. And the detection threshold was still very high. And so these methods were not sensitive enough. So we decided to design a nested MLST and uh, I think that most of you are quite familiar with this uh, method that is uh, commonly used in detection. And it's in fact a double PCR using a primer pair that is uh, outside of the samples you want and then you uh, run a run of PCR and then you add another primer pair that will amplify only the inner uh, target. So this uh, increased the sensitivity of the test. So here, we decided to design, based on genome alignment, some primers that are outside of the MLST uh, fragment, of the gene fragment that are used in the MLST scheme. So we designed these novel primers for each gene. And for the inner primers, we used either the U1 primers when they were satisfactory, or with a slight modification, or we used some novel primers we designed in order to have a better or balanced uh, TM and um, low harp instability. And of course, the objective was not to lose the size of the fragment that is useful and used in the MLST scheme. So after the first run of PCR, as you can see here, nearly nothing is visible and we add 35 cycles. When you are using the second run of PCR, you get a better sensitivity with detection threshold that can be as low as 10 to the three. So here it's quite interesting. So we decided also to test the specificity because it is always the question, the specificity of this MLST and this, uh, of these novel uh, primers, this was tested both in silico and on strains. And we tested this method on a large range of samples. So we tested them on uh, samples that came from the official test from 2016 and 2017 and for which the results were not clear. So this represents 11 plant species and we have 158 samples and we increase the number of samples that could be typed from two to four times depending on the gene. And we also used this uh, nested MLST on the samples I presented to you before, so the 106 samples representing the 37 plant species. And we increased at least with Le A by uh, 3.5, the number of samples that could be typed. So of course, we have more samples that could be typed. So in conclusion, the nested MLST gave a better yield and an increased sensitivity. And this nested, PCR, uh, this nested MLST was also developed, but in an independent way, for the detection of xylella on insects by the team of Jean-Yves Rasplus and Astrid Cruyff. We also see that uh, undetermined samples can be typed, so that can be very interesting also. For recalcitrant matrices, we combine polymerases to increase the sensitivity and the yield. And for example, the platinum was used on tenth sample on diluted one, one to tenth, and then the GOTAC. And we also produce, propose a reduced scheme based on the efficiency on the yield of this nested uh, MLST to use MALF and NUOL for the subspecies identification. 
And what I shall say also is that using this method on all these 300 and more samples is that we found a larger set of allelic forms than it was previously expected. And that all goes in the idea that we could maybe face uh, various introduction and certainly more ancient than what we sought in France. And I would like just to thank the people who participate in this work and especially Sophie Sebron who is here and did most of the work but also the, the dif different funding partners. Our colleague from Corsica, Laetitia Hugo from Conservatoire National, the course, uh, François Casabianca from INRA, our colleague from ANSES, some are here. And I also just want to add an ad on the cost action, Eurozone, the objective of which is to propose integrating science on Xanthomonadaceae, so the family that uh, group Xanthomonas and Xylella, for integrated plant disease management in Europe. So here you have the website of this cost action that I encourage you to visit. And these are the two next actions that was proposed by this cost action. Was in, one is a training school in Crete in, Crete in February and the annual conference that will be held in July in Halle in Germany. So thank you for your attention. We come to the last speaker of this session, who will present um, results on the real-time lump PCR to have uh, xylella detected in plant material and insect vectors. It will be presented by Yassin Taher from Siam in Bari. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organization for the very well organized meeting. Um, and thank you again for them to being the only man for this session for the, between these beautiful ladies. Um, starting the, the talk about real time lamb, uh, a lot of you follow this. Um, I know it's too late and most of you is sleepy and me too, I start to feel sleepy. <laughs> I try to be fast and make it painful um, without being. <laughs> um, so the real time is, um, method is um, start because we are searching to find a new method, a ideal diagnostic suitable for, the, for this activity. So we're searching to have a reliable detection method, affordable, sensitive, specific, user friendly, robust and rapid, equipment free if it's possible, and deliverable to the final user if we can do that. We will have the maximum. So the technique is not um, actually not becomes any more new. Uh, it started in 2000, uh, discovered by Netomi et al, and now patented by Aiken Genomics I. Um, the method um, going rapidly developed in the world and applied in many researches and fields. If you go have a fast look on the database, be, um, uh, Bob made you found uh, a special, a faster search, you can find something like more than 1,668 1, paper or article, scientific article on that topic. This is making us to be more curious about that and searching to include it in other researches. So a um, few words on how it works. The, the method is quite specific because we, we use generally um, four uh, primers, it's two inner and two outer primers and could be implemented by other two primers with Luba primers, this is make it more specific. Uh, it could be designed easily by free of charge uh, website, you can find it in Primer Explorer and there is several versions updated in this website. So the method is generally like the, the, the normal BCR, but here the difference is we have unique temperature, this is why they call it isothermal, it's 65 degrees centigrade. Um, uh, no need to have denaturation step because the reaction, this is why it's more, very fast. And the amplification, if you can see, very high as compared with the normal BCR. So we have a big amount of the DNA inside the tube and this is making it some risky of contamination. The risk of contamination is very high when you use LAMP. 
uh, reduce the cost of equipment because the device which we use for lamp is a simple heater ma making the temperature at 65 and this is all. We don't need to have a thermocycler making cycles. Uh, the other important point that the specificity um, could be even improved to have more than four primers or more than six primers adding, adding a probe if we want to make it quantitative. Um, the method is uh, actually if you're taking about pure DNA, it's more sensitive than other BCR and QBCR and analytically it's less sensitive. Uh, we go for determine um, the resequation time, so the time for doing a BCR is more longer than doing LAMP. This is the first point. The other point, in case of LAMP, we are needed even to make extraction in many cases because we can work even in crude extract. And you will see that we can do it even for entire insect directly inside the tube. Um, the new protein was added in some commercial kits to make it able to be stored at four degrees. So we don't need to stock the kits at minus 20. And this is improved the method to be able to, done, to run the test in the field. And this is uh, very important for the don't moving plant material from infected area and a healthy area where we have laboratories, where we have equipment. So we can run it on site uh, without moving plant material from one area to another one. Um, there are several cases. I just mentioned a um, few cases about uh, where we they apply it in, 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 uh, in plant pathology. For, uh, we have some examples in Phytophthora uh, or, or downy mildew, boundary mildew, or renal mullovera, botrytis, and the lastly of um, Exilella fastidiosa. We use primer of Harbor, but in Harbor, Harbor work, he make a normal lamp. He didn't make the real time lamp. We transform the to be a real time lamp. So just making it very fast because they, in the work of Harbor, they work in turbidity. So you have to see the DNA inside the tube. Um, as much the quantity of DNA is high, so you are able even to see the DNA inside the tube. But what we did, we make it in, um, in real time detection. So the procedure is very simple. Uh, the, just we need nucleic acid extraction, which take 10 minutes at 65 degree heating. And in, this, in the meantime, we will can prepare in this 10 minutes to prepare the lamp reaction, but take a few minutes. And the last one is genetic amplification, which approximately take um, we decide our time by ourselves, something like 25 minutes will be enough to have a good amplicon. Um, here is the step how it works. We, we can use uh, several devices. Uh, there is several devices working on that on some example here in outside. Uh, I'm, I'm just showing you the example which we generally use is uh, the IC gene. And this is tricky. They, they make it like this. They make it the name of the device IC gene to make it is I'm able to see the gene inside the tube. This is commercial point. Um, so to start the app, and you can make just, if you want to work in plant material, we, the, we can work just in olive in this case, um, because the method was detected, uh, or that proved to, be, to work very good in olive when we are, we'll get olive bottles. Four to five uh, olive uh, bottles from several parts of the plant in, in the inside the tube, and if you can use the insect, we can use the entire insect. If we collect it from the field, uh, um, conserve it in ethanol, we have to leave it to dry some minutes in the lab and then put it inside the tube. Um, insert the tube inside ICG and we can run the reaction 65 degree for 10 minutes. We have the extraction. In the meantime, we will prepare the master mix. The master mix, um, we add 22.5 of lamp mix and we add five microliter of the extract inside, and we can run the, re the, the, the reaction. We have the amplification in 25 minutes. The amplification could be projected directly in, in, uh, as a curve of the real time. We have positive. If we have no amplification, we have no line. We have a flat line like this. So um, the important point that if we work for other hosts, not olive hosts, we prefer to use ELISA extract. So ELISA extract works for all other hosts for olive. And insect, we can use brand material and, and uh, directly insect inside the, inside the tube. If you want to pull several samples together, we can get just the head of insect inside the tube. As you can see here, we can make up to five insects inside one tube. But the good thing, if we have the entire insect, we can collect all the insects and test them, and then we can go to classify them. This is for an area where we want to survey who are the victor in the, of this xylella. 
and this is the case of several countries now. Um, uh, the, the problem which I, we talk about a plant residue inside, inside the sample. When we make ELISA, ELISA extract, we have a, a lot of plant residue inside the, the, uh, the plant. So we think about why we didn't go to extract the sap of the plant and put it inside the tube and to try to see if we are getting the same example of human being blood, why we didn't test the blood of the plant and to see. And we found that it's very efficient. And this is why we make the patent here. And this is just February 2nd. Uh, we built in this method how to do it from the sub extract. And this is the patent of the, uh, by the name of the, our institute. So we also do this small adapter to make it more easy. Um, we can have several sides of the blunt tissue. Here is we have the um, uh, extraction buffer, and we have the small filter here inside. And here we have the piece of the plant, number 12, where you can just push the extraction buffer through the tube, and we get just the sap of the plant. This is few drops of the liquid coming extraction buffer plus the sap of the plant is sufficient to make the test. And I would suggest that to be done also for MLST. Or it could be done also for asymptomatic plants. We have no the problem of BCR on other problem. Other technique, uh, technical for detection is the residue of plants. And in this way, we are not getting anything. Why we should crash the plant and got all the residue of them? We can get the, the sap of the plant. Um, going back to the insects, I should say that the first screen we did in Puglia, we collect a lot of insects. And we have the first paper here where we, we search for potential insects, and we found that um, and we found that Neophilonus cambestris, they have the bacterium, they harbor the bacterium before knowing that only Philenus is the, uh, the only efficient vector. But we found them, they are containing the bacteria. And this is why we make the work, we call it spy insect, visiting for spy insects. Spy insects which help us in a free area where we don't have any symptomatic plants. I'm still wondering why we search always in our monitoring for symptomatic plants. Why we didn't search for the insects, which could contain the bacterium, and the symptoms will arrive one year later, or more than that. So, so, so spy insects work, technology could work very good, I think. Um, here I go, I want to thank Region Puglia uh, by Dr. Skito and Dr. Uh, uh, Bercoco because they finance a research, and here's a poster and outside about this activity, and you can ask my colleague Franco, Franco uh, Valentini about that, uh, where we collect a lot of insects, something like 2,000 insects in a free area, and all samples was georeflorized by Xilab. The Xilab is an app done by our institute where we can able to uh, localize the sample and have all the georeflorization of the sample. Um, then we run the lamp and we are able to understand where is, how the, the insect moving with the bacterium without getting any symptoms. This area was, in that time, free area of Xylella, and then symptoms appears later. Um, the other point is the data, using this system, we are able even to collect all the data in the website. And we have the, all the information in what we call it IC Gene Web. Um, now we are working in the X, X, X factor, the colleague of uh, Franco Santoro, to join the two apps, the one of ICG together with the app with Xilab for the georeferralization. So the, I can identify the sample directly by this when I'm running the sample. I am able to know where it is, and when I get the result, the results go back and talk with the other app and georeferralize again to change the color of the sample from green to be red if it's infected or not. Um, this is a, a, a test we did it for sensitivity, and we found for pure DNA, it's the, as compared with the real-time uh, BCR, we found the sensitivity is more high. We can find even 10 femtograms could be detected by the real-time BCR doing with the same DNA. Um, uh, other tests done for b bacteria, so a serial dilution of bacteria, we are able to detect uh, 10 cells of the bacterium in pure extraction. Um, but if you go to the uh, analytical way, 
we, when we search for analytical analysis, we kind of the sensitivity uh, is less than the QPCR when we use the LAMP kit of Embiotech from the SAP. But this is why, because we have a um, few quantity of the sample come inside the device, we just get three microliter for the reaction. Um, so uh, the concluding, uh, the real time is, we found that it's user-friendly method, easy to use, I mean, mm, the cost is less costly because we didn't have extraction costly process, because you know the extraction case is very high expensive. Um, it's more efficient, and we can be able to do it for uh, um, sap extract. We can do it in directly from insects. Um, uh, the other point, we can save the kit in room temperature. We can send it, we can ship it. We don't need a minus 20 degree, and this is a very good point. The important, I want to recommend again, to, for insect vector monitoring, especially for a country we're still searching to know where, what is the vector. We can just collect all the insects and test them. You can know what is it. The important point is also in quarantine cross-border monitoring. Um, actually, I want to just to mention you what we did in, a, in collaboration with FAO. We have the project TCB RAP 3601, and we make training and formation of several countries. And started from last August, uh, in the August 2016, um, uh, this, all these members of this project were able to learn, to know, and to start working, and how so there are several countries, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Libya, uh, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, Syria, and Tunisia, and they are, most of them, collecting samples from imported blend material, running the test, the test in, in the border, and just to know if they have xylella crossing the border, even asymptomatic plants. Thank you for that, your attention. So now we are coming <clears throat> to the second important part of this session, which is the questioning and the discussion. I uh, have the expectation that there are a lot of remarks or questions. Yes? Peter. Uh, thank you all for the nice presentations you gave on, on diagnostics. Uh, you know that I'm a diagnostic for many years, and, and one, one of the questions, I, I talked to Danielle also, um, I didn't hear anything about internal controls. So if you do amplification, you get false negative, false positive, you have PCR inhibition. Um, yeah, we use now the internal control of the NAC Tynbau because we think it's uh, an interesting internal control to be used in any sample so that you have a positive control all the ways. If you see PCR inhibition, then the CT value is changed, so you know that you have PCR inhibition. And, and I want your comment on, on, on this, this, this aspect, please. Who will uh, take the first answer? Yeah, Juliana. Uh, yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, our group uh, developed <coughs> a protocol of duplex of, uh, uh, format duplex of uh, QPCR based on the use of uh, uh, primers and Tuckman probe reported by Harper and the Cox, uh, and the Cox gene, our group. But uh, it is absolutely, probably in a, uh, uh, performed at TPS on the internal, uh, with the internal control uh, also, not only the target gene for Xylella, but uh, in addition only all um, several genes for the internal controls. Uh, yes. Okay. In the various sets of plant materials that we were using, we used the spiked uh, plant matrices, so we had samples from uh, Xylella free plant material representing these various plant species, and we spike them. 
Yes, the spike uh, option is also what we do. For all individual samples we analyze, we have also a, uh, a spike sample uh, going together for the analysis. Yes, then, then you have two samples, I agree. Um, just a, to add one point regarding LAMP, because um, in the last device which you are using, you have one single fluorophore detection. This is why we were not able to, to use internal control. In the um, previous uh, devices, we have another fluorophore inside, another de detector, and we, we use it in the past, uh, where we use HLB detection uh, method in, in LAMP. It works very perfectly. I agree with you. Another question, Emilio, hi. Yeah, uh, my question is addressed to, uh, maybe the figure was presented, but I, I didn't pay attention about that, which is the level of detection of the best method, as I assume it, which is the QPCR, and a comment on that. Uh, you did a huge amount of work uh, setting up and optimizing the methods, probably thinking more on laboratories, uh, official laboratories for detection and for screening samples. And uh, most of the data you presented were in CT values, CFU per reaction tube, and so on. But uh, thinking about epidemiology, which is we need quantitative data in the field about information like inoculum potential, we need information about minimal infection dose. And this is uh, an important issue for epidemiology. So my final question is level of detection in terms of living cells per gram of plant material, which is really what is important in epidemiology. Maria? Um, you cannot generalize it because the limit of detection for the most sensitive method you asked for, um, I, you cannot, it, I mean, it is not the same in the different matrices. It depends on which plant species you have to work with. That's the first part of the question. And I think that this session deals not with epidemiological aspects, but with detection. So in most of us, in the presentations we gave, we uh, actually simulated uh, in the matrices spiked or uh, artificially inoculated in order to uh, be able to see how the different methodologies work. So uh, none of us presented any data about epidemiological aspects. I agree with you, this is a very important issue to study the epidemiology of xylella fastidiosa in the different environments and the different situations. But this is not what actually was performed here. Maybe in that instance it can also be uh, interesting not only to have these test performance studies in OLIVE, but also in other backgrounds. Because, and especially also with the background signals you have, we know that in Prunus, in Salix, in, uh, in Oak less, but you have these background signals. So, and OLIVE you do not have them, or very rarely, but in the other cases you have it not rarely. Uh, it is not as Francois said, it is rarely, no, it is not rarely, it is very, very often you have that. So that could be uh, an extra plan for the future, I think, yes. to, <laughs> to quantify yeah. the different backgrounds. I want also to add that for epidemiological purpose, I think it is very important to have a very precise uh, description of what is the current situation. So we also need to have uh, an idea of what is present now and to see afterwards if it is dispersed efficiently or not. And uh, if all these uh, strains that or STs that are present at one moment can survive or not. So I think as a first step for epidemiological study in the future, we really need to have a right, uh, an accurate description of the current situation. Claude? Yeah, May maybe two questions. Maybe one for Marianne's Jacques about your last comment on the ancient and recent introductions. That's the first question. And maybe a second one for the 
uh, all the people there. What is your view about the need to isolate the bacteria in terms of identification detection versus common techniques that have been explained? Well, I think it, can, it will be very interesting if we can uh, isolate more efficiently the bacterium. Right now, we were not that successful for the various plant species we are dealing with. So we are trying to increase our efficiency in isolated from some uh, plant species, but in fact, in the natural environment, it seems that at least in the samples we are analyzing, not all are contaminated with high bacterial levels. And so we are facing two difficulties, this uh, quite low bacterial level and these various plant matrices. So not only you have to increase your capacity to isolate from one type of plant material, but from several. So yes, it is our goal, of course, to isolate the strain because it will be very, very interesting to have access to the strain, to have access also to the genome and to make some functional genomics. So it is done, I think, by most of the lab in parallel of all these uh, genomic approaches. Yes, if first. Uh, thank you. I really appreciated the session. I thought it was really interesting um, talking about um, your proficiency testing and validation and moving through to the sampling and uh, looking at the um, subspecific uh, issues that you, you had and, and new technologies. My question is about the subspecific determination and the MLST and uh, that there are, there has been or are issues with regards to amplifying some of these genes and it's very interesting what you've been doing at INRA, Marianas. And I'm just wondering, there's mention of reducing those seven housekeeping genes to two. So I want to split my question almost in two. Um, has there been any congruence, any, any analysis uh, to support the determination at subspecies level with just two genes as opposed to the seven. And I'm not sure if I should say this, but um, yesterday morning feels like such a long time ago. And I'm not sure if I was dreaming or just, um, you know, jet lagged from traveling from Ireland or whatever. <laughs> but um, uh, I think somebody was talking about various variants or there were some anomalies being thrown up with these seven genes. And I'm just wondering whether or not what we have with this subspecific specific determination with M MLST approach with this YAN uh, protocol, whether or not it's giving us uh, a desired level of resolution and that we have a, 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 sufficient mic a sufficient lens to be looking at what might actually be out there in addition to the, the four which we're looking at at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure if I've made myself clear. You're looking a little perplexed. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, are there other anomalies and are we able to pick them up with this approach or should we be looking at something a little bit more um, uh, with a higher level of resolution? As, the, as this whole thing, uh, you know, the MLST for the subspecific termination, you know, drives our, our management choices uh, with the disease. So I think that Francoise can also answer for the reduction of two genes versus uh, seven. But there are several ways to choose these two genes using uh, methods that are testing the congruencies of trees you are comparing. So there are several options that are available to reduce the scheme at two genes. But of course, the result you will have will, is not the same you have an idea of the subspecies, of the phylogenetic position of your strain, but you will not have the ST. So it's not exactly the same, and you are not able to do the same type of analysis. But it can be a, a nice first approach to have an idea of what you have in your, in your samples. So it's just a first approach. If you want to make some uh, analysis of the founder strain or something like that, you of course need to have access to the seven genes. But honestly, when you are dealing with a, a, a large range of plant species, in sometimes it's just so far not possible to have access to seven genes. So we have also to use this data that are provided by less than seven genes. 
And sometimes it's very frustrating, and I think it's also uh, not very efficient to leave apart a whole bunch of data that are just uh, not totally complete because you have six genes out of the sevens. So it's a way of using also this kind of data, but you do not have the ST in that case. And uh, the, I think one way to answer the second part of the question is that uh, when you have the ST, for example, for us in uh, Corsica, most of the strain, more than 95% for the 2015 analysis we made, were uh, multiplex ST6 or ST7. But then we, we have no more precise data on that. And if we want to, uh, to be able to draw the roots of dis dispersion of this strain, we need uh, more precise data. So we are right now developing MLVA approach to, to have a more precise typing of the strain. So to have, uh, but this can be done only on some samples and only on the strains, that, or on the samples that are contaminated by ST6 or ST7, you see? So, but this can be very interesting on an epidemiological point of view to retrace the roots of dispersion of this contaminant. So it's another uh, question. I don't know if I, um, we can, um, I'm just uh, curious as, I hear what you're saying, but in terms of, uh, uh, we only have seven genes to, in which to make this subspecific determination. And if we're not hitting all those seven, well, you know, making the management choices that you need to do can be compromised. So I'm wondering whether or not uh, there's something else out there that's more reliable or equally reliable, well, maybe more reliable, I should say, than what we have at the moment. Um, would it be a, a step, a, a, a jump, from, from this approach to total gene sequencing or whatever? Or is there something more intermediary? Of course. That's an option. That's yeah. an option. Can I first answer to the first part of the question, why two genes? Um, in fact, when, you, when we're looking, uh, when, okay, I speak under the control of the members of the working group, so you're, I'm happy that you say, Francois, stop saying rubbish things. Um, uh, so when the, the, the the experience of the lab is that with two, you can do the subspecies identification. So that's the baseline. In some case, you won't, and then you will do uh, the seven genes. You will try to do the seven genes. So it's not like, and of course, for new species, new hosts, or new findings, uh, you have to do the seven genes. So it's, it's, I think it's more, I would qualify it as a more pragmatic approach because it's less costly for the labs. So if you can achieve the same result with the two, go for the two. If then you have inconclusive result, it's, it's a stepwise approach. So I don't know if this is giving you the answer, but it's, it's more a stepwise approach than do everything all the time or, and when, when labs will not have the capacity also to do it. That's a reality. Next. Thank you very much. Uh, I have three questions, if you allow. Uh, the first uh, is uh, about uh, the diagnostic protocol. Uh, I am very pleased that there is a new protocol. Uh, however, it would be nice uh, that the official laboratories could use it during uh, the analysis of the samples taken uh, in the 2018 uh, survey campaign. And uh, in this relation, uh, the uh, time uh, of May when the protocol is available uh, is quite late. Is it possible uh, to uh, accelerate yeah. this the procedure and have it, uh, uh, the protocol ready uh, in March, for example? <laughs> um, it's, it's possible, I would say. Everything is possible. <laughs> um, uh, the, only, the only problem I, I have, well, in fact, this is a proposal I made on Sunday. Why don't we go for a country consultation now in two weeks when I'm back from different meetings and then um, have it in spring? But then what about the lead test? So the lead test at the moment is not included. So one, what we could do, and then it could delay for, I mean, who is preparing the lead description? I'm looking to... <laughs> 
the panel members, and it's not me that you have to kill, but this guy. Um, so if we have the lead description, um, we could send it for country consultation with the lead description and say that the result of the TPS will help us to make a decision to include it or not. So that's an option, and then we could have it earlier. Then I can give you, uh, we can have the, the, the protocol in, in March, provided, I mean, I'm assuming that countries are happy, experts in countries are happy with it, and that we don't have any formal objection in spring. So it's possible. Uh, the next question uh, relates uh, to the uh, quick pick, uh, quit, uh, because uh, in two presentations uh, I heard about issues uh, with uh, this uh, uh, DNA extraction uh, kit uh, uh, in relation uh, to the low bacterial concentration. Do you think that despite of uh, these uh, concerns, uh, it is still recommended to use this kit? Is, uh, the automated platform is recommended, yes, because um, uh, remove better the beads in the final steps, because probably uh, um, uh, the beads that remain in the, uh, in the final step can inhibit the uh, following reaction. But I mean, uh, can we opt for the CTAB instead of quick quick? Um, but it depends uh, um, uh, by, on the matrix because uh, with olive, CTAB, American uh, kit uh, work very well. But with other matrix as uh, uh, almond, uh, oleander, CTAB uh, um, didn't perform very well. So it, uh, it depends on the matrix. My last question uh, is uh, about uh, the LAMP method. I am very pleased uh, that the LAMP is recommended uh, for the detection uh, of uh, uh, the uh, Silella in insect samples. However, we uh, heard uh, in recent studies uh, that uh, the eyes of the insect uh, work uh, as a, a, a PCR impedimenter. Uh, do you have any experience how to deal uh, with uh, this issue during the LAMP tests? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I expecting some question like this. Um, uh, actually, we make the experiment with eyes and without eyes, and we didn't find in any differences for lamp. For BCR, uh, you are correct, but for lamp, there is no differences. I still have a, a question, um, and I don't know if it's the case. The results of the test performance studies, are they also taken up in the diagnostic protocol? Because that is interesting for new labs uh, or to change from uh, one uh, protocol to another or to, to make the, the good decisions. Martin, you mean the results? The results the and the conclusions of the TPS. It, they are not taken as such. I think because otherwise you have to decide. Well, I, on have some a, I have a suggestion just uh, mm. out of my just now, um, like um, putting it forward. Um, we could have, if it's possible, to link to the result of the TPS. We could have it as an, a document that could be linked Hola. in the diagnostic protocol. Mm -hmm. So then we could link to the report and say results of the TPS are available and then we can have a supple <coughs> sorry, supplementary documents and then in this case it's possible to have the result of the TPS attached if, if, if it's possible. I don't know if it has to be approved first or... Well, it is important information. Eh? Yeah, yeah. And, and just uh, to <laughs> add on the preparation of the insects, um, we have very nice videos uh, about uh, the preparation of plant samples, but also of insect samples. We just had to change the title of the video not to be caught by the police in France because it was called decapitation. <laughs> I was afraid that we would have the terrorist police coming to <laughs> Apple to, <laughs> to check about what we're doing with uh, our videos. So um, we have videos available on our YouTube channel uh, to help with the preparation of the, of the sample. 
And I think there are also nice videos on uh, X Factor website on how to prepare the sample. So that's helpful information as well. Maria Lopez. Thank you. I would like to make a, a comment and a question. The comment is related to the isolation because we were the last in arriving we were the last in arriving to the club of the Silela countries uh, affected and uh, we suffered the same problems in isolating the bacteria not the first time because we were lucky but uh, the next times that we try it maybe uh, the sonicated that we didn't try it uh, the sonication can help in uh, having more success but uh, I think that we are uh, using a very old media that were not uh, good media, uh, not only for isolation in our experience, but also in maintaining the bacteria. We also had problems when uh, trying to maintain different strains, and we have observed differences among strains of Silella fastidiosa of different subspecies in the standard media. Then, as I am currently retired, maybe it's a uh, suggestion to try to improve uh, the, the media in order to have uh, more possibilities of having more uh, strains of the bacteria and maybe the information from the genomes available should be taken into account for designing a uh, fit for purpose uh, media. This is the suggestion, a very difficult uh, task, I know, but, uh, uh, and the question is uh, related to the uh, lamp uh, uh, extraction device, uh, because uh, we have had a very good experience in extracting the, the sap for uh, plants, and I agree that this is the best material for the analysis, but uh, our good experience was with grapevine that have a very big vessels, probably olive uh, plants also. And uh, I'm curious about uh, the different plants, that uh, species of plants that you have checked and for which uh, the device is fine for extracting the sap. Um, I will relate to the last point. Thank you very much. Um, actually, it is one from the uh, task activity in EOFRESCO project. And uh, um, the meeting on Sunday night, we did just a small review of what we are doing in EOFRESCO project. And uh, this is what exactly we are doing. Um, actually, um, we have some inhibition when we have a high quantity of the bacteria inside the sap. So this is what we suggest is to make also the dilution when we have big amount, when you extract the sap from some host plants. So to don't do the lamp directly from the, uh, from the talpoil or the pure extract from the sap. So we are running also for, for other host plants. We run it just for the 30 host plants we have it in Puglia. And maybe in the future and other activity we'll run it on other host plants in, in Europe. We still have some minutes. Yes. Moment, moment. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Afshtal Mohammed from Morocco. Uh, you know, Xerella fastidiosa is not yet present in my country, but we think that is only probably uh, is probably only a matter of time because uh, before that uh, this bacterium arrives in my country, especially if the, if you, when you know that uh, Morocco is only 20 kilometers away from Spain where the bacterium is present. I have two questions concerning the diagnostic, diagnostic techniques. The first one is. Uh, what is the, or what are the best diagnostic to, uh, techniques to be used in uh, my country in order to perform large-scale surveys of the, the present, uh, on the presence of the bacterium? And the second question is concerning the plant, plant material to be used. What uh, do we have to take uh, only symptomatic uh, samples or uh, samples that, uh, or uh, do it at random? because uh, leaf scorch symptoms are very widespread in my country uh, because of the, the on, over my environmental conditions, especially drought, uh, salinity, and the, the, due to the abundance uh, of the calcareous, in my, in, in, uh, calcareous soils in uh, the country. Thank you. Okay. Who's going to answer? You can answer. 
symptoms. Uh, concerning your question about the, which kind of material to use, symptomatic or not, I think uh, you, you have a more chance to find cellular if you use symptomatic material, although the symptoms are not always very typical. So it can be also attributed to abiotic uh, conditions. Um, however, it's not only using uh, uh, symptomatic plant material. You can also use asymptomatic, but you only have to adjust uh, the size of the sample you have to use per, ca per case. Uh, according to what is described in the diagnostic protocol. Um, and your first question is? The best test to perform. Um, sorry? <laughs> oh, for lar uh, yes. I, I think if you, if you speak about symptomatic material, you can use a conventional PCR or ELISA if it's symptomatic material. But still, uh, in the EPO standard, we advise that uh, the first test to be used for uh, asymptomatic plant material needs to be a molecular test, simply because the uh, detection limit is, um, so these tests are more sensitive than the serological tests. So depending on the case, we, you cannot get a very uh, black or white answer, but depends, depending on the case, you can, you can make a choice. Yes. One last question. Maybe I have a, a question to Maria Merksman. You are speaking about uh, spy plants, but in these uh, examples you gave, you inoculate with bacteria. Yes. And then you see, okay, you have Polygala and Oleander, I think, mm -hmm. that were maybe the best mm -hmm. um, uh, spy plants. So is it then, or in my understanding, an, a spy plant is a plant that would express easily the symptoms. So would it then be the option uh, not to inoculate the, the strains, but for instance, an extract that is contaminated, you are unsure about the contamination, you inoculate it in your spy plant and there it should evolve. So no, what is the definition of a spy plant in your, in your uh, Yes, a, a, spy, a spy plant or indicator plant is indeed a plant which can uh, show symptoms quite easy yeah. after infection. Mm -hmm. um, your proposal to use instead of um, inoculating cells of Xylella fastidiosa and then to use extracts of infected plants. Um, we have uh, performed at the beginning some experiments from coffee and it didn't work. So uh, we, we didn't see any symptoms, but we could not also detect Xylella fastidiosa in this inoculated coffee plants uh, when using uh, infected plant extract. So, um, and, and the reason for these uh, spy or indicator plants is simply that if you include them in um, uh, confined conditions, in case that uh, uh, with important plant material, for example, vectors are also per accident coming there, then you have more high chance if the vectors are infected to find also Xylella fastidiosa in these plants. Okay, more related to the vector application and, and maybe plant to the plant extracts can be infected before, yes. Okay, so I think if there are no more questions that we can close uh, this session and uh, have a coffee break. Thank you.